Matthew Rigney. I'm, I'm a Ngunnawal man, um, a corny in, in Ngunnawal language. Uh, that's how I define myself in terms of my identity. I'm the uh, eldest son of Matthew and Margaret Rigney. Uh, my father being Ngunnawal and my mother being a, a non-Aboriginal person. Um, I have a, two brothers and a sister and uh, my two brothers have been actively involved in working in Aboriginal organisations for, for many years now. Uh, my sister's um, been studying for, for some time and um, has completed her degree at the University of Adelaide in, um, in English and uh, Anthropology it's, uh, not, not too long ago, so it's at the forefront of my mind. Um, I grew up in a number of places actually across the state of South Australia. My uh, father, Matt, was involved um, in his work life as in the railways and that uh, moved us around from Adelaide to a little town in the Murray Mallee called Borica to uh, from there to Tail and Bend in Ngunnawal country uh, over to the west coast to Minipa, uh, then to Port Lincoln and then back to Adelaide. Uh, so I went to something like six different primary schools in my seven years of primary education uh, as dad moved around in his work workplace. Um, and so I kind of locate myself in that way in terms of my family, um, country or Rui, uh, with being Ngarindri. Um Dad was a, um, one of 12 other children um, in his family. He, he grew up on Raukan, uh, Point Maclay Mission, um, moved to Adelaide and was moved to Sutton's Boys Home as a part of uh, the generation of children who are encouraged to leave homes, leave their homes and be put into institutions in various parts of the country. He went into Sutton's. Uh, Sutton's Boys Home is located at uh, Esplanade and Union Street in Larks Bay. Um, it, the building's physically no longer there. but uh, So he grew up there for a while um, and, uh, and then you know, ended up moving back to Raukin at a later date and then come back to Adelaide for football because he's quite a good football player. What inspired me to become a teacher? One of the things my father uh, was very strong on, well both my parents actually, was the need to complete high school. And I remember on many occasions both of them telling me that if I didn't stay at school, uh, because a lot of my cousins didn't, and they, they left school early and did other things, uh, if I didn't stay at school they'd give me a big kick up the backside. And, um, and I, I can't remember ever, or very often, um, Ever disobeying what my father said, you know, and he, he very rarely had to discipline us with a, with a you know, tap across the backside for, for doing anything wrong. I think it probably only happened to me four times in, in my entire life, but he would just look at me, uh, or look at the rest of my brothers and sisters, and you kind of knew, yeah, pull your, pull your head in and get into line. And so I stayed at school um, and uh, completed year 12 at the Parks um, Community Centre, and, uh, and from there I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I first um, enrolled in university life um, as in, a, in an accountancy degree. So I went from school, managed to get through somehow in between football, um, girlfriends and other things in life, um, managed to get through. Went into accountancy and uh, didn't do very well. I, I struggled. I wasn't very committed to, to study at that point. Left, um, went and worked in a bank for two years and after I was unemployed for a while. And then um, I, whilst I was in the bank, I thought there's got to be more to life than people walking in and saying, that's a wonderful day outside. And, and my response was, yeah, probably. Have. And I was thinking, I haven't seen much of it at all. I've been locked in this bank counting other people's money <laughs> for some time. So I thought I wanted to do something different. And after a year, I, um, through a rela family relationship, uh, Aunty Maria Lane, who was such a significant influence in, in many uh, Aboriginal people's lives, particularly if they were going to teacher education um, at, the, at then the Underdale campus of the South Australian College of Advanced Education. And, uh, and she spoke to me about um, doing study, coming to be a teacher. And um, I thought that's what I wanted to do. So I kind of let the bank know that I was going to leave 
And uh, then, of course, they, they started telling me things that I'd probably like to hear, you know, like, don't go, you'll be manager material one day, and, you know, you, you've got a good career here. And my parents saying, you know, a job in the bank is a job for life, and you'll be always set, and those sorts of things. And I kind of fell into that pattern of believing that for, for another year, another year of being frustrated, locked in that building at the bank. So at the end of the second year, I was determined to get out. And I thought, what do I want to do? Uh, and I was you know, heavily involved and played at quite a high level of uh, football. Uh, I used to play for Port Adelaide Magpies and played state football and so on as a junior. And um, so I was kind of interested in sport. Um, and I thought, well, what better thing to do than be a sports teacher, a, a PE teacher? Uh, and so um, I let Arnie Maria know that that's what I wanted to do. And um, we talked about what was possible. I wanted to go into secondary school, um, teacher education. And at the time, it was very, very competitive to get into, into that. I think it, it was certainly one of the top five um, courses within the state in terms of competitiveness, largely because there were you know, big numbers of people who wanted to do it. And, um, and so I was told at the time that I couldn't get um, into the secondary teacher education program to be a physical education teacher, but there was space for me to be able to go into the primary um, teacher education program. And I sort of dug my heels in and said, no, I'm not interested and don't want to do that. Um, and eventually after some negotiation and a lot of advocacy from people within the Aboriginal Education Unit and, and uh, Annie Maria Lane, um, I was able to get into secondary teacher education. Uh, I soon learned that it wasn't about playing sport all day long. I thought I'd be kicking a footy around and having a hit of the tennis racket, um, that there was something called teaching involved with doing that. And, uh, and that's you know, when I sort of um, committed myself, I guess, in a sense, to, be, to, to make the best of that. I had a, a wonderful set of um, friends um, who were indeed the other students in the student body. It was a relatively small group. There was about 50 of us. Um, in that uh, year level and that group of 50 people because of the nature of the course you know we would do things that were active and about and you connect to people and get to know them very well all around a common interest around sport um, so we had people who were you know Olympic kayakers and you know Australian road cycling champions and people who'd been members of Australian water polo teams and other things like that in that environment and it was just fun we had a great time and uh, and so if it hadn't been as much fun, I don't know if I would have stayed in it. It was just wonderful. And uh, so I stayed, completed my four years and um, became a qualified phys ed teacher. My experiences of being a classroom teacher, uh, uh, in, in a sense, I feel, like, I feel like they're quite limited. I, um, when I came out of my degree, the first thing I did, um, and one of the really exciting opportunities that, that teacher education offered, was that there were people coming from other parts of the world to have a look at the program that was there. And there was a, a professor out of the West Virginia University in the United States who was trying to think, uh, encourage um, students from our program to go as graduate students to the US and his university. And so a, a good friend of mine uh, who, who teaches now in St Michael's uh, College and here in Adelaide, South Australia, um, we both decided to go over to the US. And, uh, and, and begin a master's degree, a master of science. And, uh, and we did that for a, for a while. My, my, the role over there, was a, it was a scholarship. So half time I would teach American undergraduate university students, phys ed, and half the time I would try and do my own study. And uh, that was going along quite well, except that um, I was madly in love and the woman who later became my wife and I decided I couldn't be in the US and I wanted to be in Australia, so I headed back at that time and, uh, and from there when I came back um, I spent some time unemployed, um, mostly not because of a lack of job opportunity as, as uh, Maria Lane and Joe Lane, Uncle Joe Lane would always say that there is not one unemployed Aboriginal teacher in this state unless they've chosen to be um, and doing other things and, and it was very true at the time I couldn't remember any people who came through. Um, Faye Blanche was, was there um, in the years that uh, I was. Uh, John Lekoviak, um, a number of other people, and they all went on to, to really exciting jobs and doing you know, in, in various ways you know, in terms of what they were doing. But I came back and I, I wasn't sure about what I wanted to do. I know I wanted to, I wanted to stay in the teaching profession, that's what I'd been trained for, 
Um, I'd also spent a little bit of time prior to the US um, with um, Joe Lane at uh, the Salisbury campus of the College of Advanced Education in student support. So encouraging Aboriginal students to go to that um, university. There was a sport and uh, there was a recreation program um, out there and I also spent a lot of time working with students in wild parks and wildlife. And so I kind of, at that point I actually had a, a real interest in the, in the higher education sector because of that experience. So when I got back I was sort of wondering what I might do. Um, eventually I followed my wife up to Queensland where she uh, got a job um, at Whitsunday Anglican School. Doesn't that sound fantastic? Um, and it was. <laughs> she had a, it was a good school to work in. I had the best life. I worked four hours a day. Um, I would teach uh, first aid at the local TAFE um, in the morning and then uh, work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and sometimes South Sea Islander students in the high school tutoring them uh, at the end of the day. And I spent a good year doing that um, kind of work. And then um, and picking up job, relief teaching jobs. So I worked in some Catholic schools in the Queensland, Mackay region is where we were. Um, and that kind of is a difficult exercise. Anybody who's, who's been involved in doing relief teaching in a school setting where you don't kind of, as Paul Hughes would say, own your children, you know, they're not yours, <clears throat> you're coming in to kind of care for them for a short period of time. It's difficult to establish the relationships, um, to build the kind of trust that's needed to have really effective kind of learning uh, relationships. And so um, I found that difficult to do. And you know, probably you know, when, when I think back to the way I used to engage my work as a teacher, I was probably more like a traffic cop, it would seem. I had like a bunch of detention slips and we'd just give them out, you know, fill them out and chuck them onto that kid and onto that kid. And you know, it was pretty poor practice really on my behalf. Later on, I, um, I ended up working you know, a little while later in Lee Creek Area School. <coughs> and um, my time at Lee Creek Area School was probably one of the most valuable times I've had as a, as a classroom teacher. It, I got to have my own class or set of classes. Um, I, was, I used to do the relief teaching for the primary um, teachers, primary school teachers. So I would take their class for a period of time during the week to allow them some free time to plan lessons and so on. Um, but I also had my own classes that I taught um, and uh, I, I just loved it. It was such a wonderful experience. I, a lot of the children from Nepabunna um, community would come to that school, to Lee Creek Area School. Uh, my pastoral care class was in the home ec room and because of that um, I had access to all the we, we would offer breakfasts and sandwiches and toasted cheese sandwiches for the for the kids who um, might have come to school without having had breakfast or were, got hungry today during the day because they didn't have lunch and so on so I got this chance to hang out with a lot of the with the, uh, the Aboriginal kids um, and my being Aboriginal in that setting kind of didn't win me any favours necessarily just because I was Aboriginal didn't didn't mean they were going to be my mate, um, but being you know, around the food certainly <laughs> helped build the relationships. Uh, they, uh, that was a wonderful time. Um, and, and it, but it was challenging for me too, because I was still a relatively new teacher, you know, in terms of owning my own class and having extended time with a group of students. <clears throat> I remember one, I had one Aboriginal student, so it's, it's often a, a time I reflect on, um, where he and I just didn't have a relationship at all. You know, we kind of would bang heads against each other. It was a real problem for me, um, trying to think about how do I manage my classroom setting with this one child. It was a year 10, it was a year 10 class, who um, would just constantly challenge me um, and challenge me as a teacher in terms of an authority figure, being an authority figure. So, I, I, and I couldn't work my way through it. I just didn't know what went on. And I, you know, I did the kind of standard things that you would do around kind of trying behaviour management and so on and got to the point where I, I just in the end asked him to leave the class, told the principal I wasn't prepared to have him in my class anymore, um, the behaviours are too out there and, and I'm not prepared to, to accept that um, and, it's, and it's impacting on all the other kids in the room, you know, let alone me and trying to manage it. Um, we then went through a negotiation process, the principal would ask me, you know, please can we put this student back into the class? And, and I would refuse, no, not having him. You know, and uh, eventually we negotiated a way through that where I was to have the student back, this young man, 
um, and uh, there were some things that he had to do and then there were, we worked out a way that we would actually work together that kind of addressed his issues. But it wasn't till a little bit later that um, he, he opened up a, a bit and I was able to find out more that you know, his father worked in the mines um, and his father was often away on shift work but when his father came home he would, he would drink. And when he when he started drinking, he would, would abuse his son. He would beat up on him. He'd, he'd um, uh, you know, build him around. You know, they'd get into fist fights and other things. And so it was only at that time I started to really understand what it meant to be a teacher, um, not just in the sense of being you know a, re a relay of information to students and saying here's what you need to learn and let's find a way to do it, but really teaching means so much more. You know, um, about connecting, about relationship. Uh, about trying to understand the kind of circumstances that your students are in, you know, and it's not an easy thing to do when you fly in, fly out, you know, relief teaching, don't get to know people and you can't build the kind of depth of relationship. So when I when I realised what was going on, we were able to, I was able to sort of understand that it wasn't me personally, you know, he wasn't sort of against me and what, it was more about what I represented as an authority figure, you know, and, and he would challenge authority figures all over the school. And, and we were able to work our way through. When I left, um, Lee Creek, and I left Lee Creek Area School to come to Flinders University, that's when I picked up my first role here. Um, he was the first student to approach me to kind of express, you know, um, some, some regret about the relationship and where it started. Um, <coughs> his sadness about uh, me leaving. Uh, and, and it was, you know, that was actually in a relatively short space of time that that relationship was able to kind of build in the way it did. Um, but that lesson for me has been really profound in terms of thinking about all the other kind of relationships that I have with students that I no longer have in the, in the kind of schooling sector, you know, um, in high schools, but what it means also in the university sector, uh, you know, the, the lives that um, the people that we come across, that they live, you know, um, the kind of issues that they face today um, and all the other things that shape that, you know, the technologies that are available that sometimes mean people aren't on campus much and you don't only sit to see them for fleeting moments. I mean, all those sorts of things, um, you know, how I manage that and how I think about that and what I'm prepared to accept in my role as an educator is kind of shaped by that one set of circumstances at Lee Creek with that boy. In fact, you know, it's been profound in that sense. For me, you know, my journey is trying to be a better, a better teacher, a better educator. What I would say to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, in relation to the teaching profession is that um, it's, it's a really rewarding profession in, in many, many ways. Uh, you know, and I think that's in part we have to remember how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people came to be in higher education. Uh, and, um, and it was primarily uh, in the caring professions. It was in teaching, it was in nursing, it was in community welfare. You know, um, and it was really only in the kind of 1980s um, that the sector, early 1980s, that the sector began to open up um, in, a, in a far broader way um, to Aboriginal people going into other areas of study. And so, you know, what we see with people of my generation and then the ones who came before it, my uncle Peter Rigney was one of the, uh, if not the first, one of the first Aboriginal teachers to graduate um, in this state, along with Bevan Wilson and Paul Hughes. I think they're probably. Uh, the three people, and if I miss anyone, I apologise for that. Um, but those people set, set a foundation for how we were to engage in the profession. They shaped it significantly, and then they've gone on to be quite significant in terms of policy work and other things that they do. But if we remember that we came out of that kind of caring space, uh, what's one of the big concerns, and it's one of the reasons that this project, you know, no doubt, is, is, is uh, being undertaken, is that as people have the sectors open up, people have made other choices about what they want to do with their life. So, you know, when I first started here in, um, in the early kind of 1990s, um, law was the, the thing that people were mostly interested in going into. It had been teacher education, then it shipped to law, and, and you know, it's changed to various other things over the years. What it's, what it's meant for us, though, is that we haven't had uh, as many people going into, into teacher education, and that's, that's a huge loss. And, and, and I say that, uh, that for a couple of reasons. One is not so much, you know, unlike many, I'm sure, who you might talk to through this project, 
and those who in fact are, are managing the project. Um, I'm not so concerned about the fact that if we have Aboriginal teachers trained and we train them and they make those sorts of choices that they should end up in schools. You know, um, that's certainly been a big push and you know, obviously that's what we're trained for. But for me I think it's actually um, another process going on um, and I think about the kind of value that those people bring to the Aboriginal community. Uh, and I'm thinking specifically about the Aboriginal community. Um, I, I've asked the question a number of times to um, people that I work with here at uh, Yongarendi First Nation Centre, um, where, where is our labour most needed? And I think our labour is most needed in our communities. And sometimes the, the task of taking up the teaching of non-Aboriginal Australia about Aboriginal Australia um, is, whilst a very important and worthy thing to do, um, actually is a drain on the kind of resources that we have available to us at the moment. We don't have the critical mass in order to be able to, to do that kind of work. So if, if all the Aboriginal teachers were only working in the schools, how do we expect change in other ways, um, change in, in policy, change in kind of big picture issues that Aboriginal communities are dealing with today? And so, um, so whilst I think that the profession is rewarding, uh, it's a great place to develop your skills, and, and to learn how to actually work with people in a, in a really kind of challenging environment. But, um, but ultimately, I think, you know, the question has to be asked about how, how people are being used most effectively in our community context. So I encourage it, and I'd love to get to the point where we have so many of us in the, in, the, in the sector, so many people doing it, that critical mass issue about the other things that we're dealing with is not a problem for us anymore, um, but I don't think we're quite there yet. And I think that the Maori model, um, that they've got going in, in New Zealand, Aotearoa, where um, emerging out of the language nests, um, where Maori withdrew their children from the from the state uh, generated education system, um, to because they didn't believe it was working for them, to going into their language nest programs, um, to then re-engaging with the state in a different way, having negotiated that, to having um, Maori teachers throughout the system but also the ability to be able to put people in their own system. So now, for example, you have three um, tribal universities in New Zealand where you have Maori running their own institutions for their own interests that are then negotiated against, you know, what are standards and other sorts of things for the professions, um, but they're doing it for themselves, you know, they're actually... And so, <coughs> you know, this is where I, where I talk about, you know, what the encouragement of Aboriginal students into the sector is, is really useful and important, but. You know, when do we get Aboriginal teachers to the point where they're teaching our own about the sorts of things that are important to us, you know, that, that, that generate a future for Aboriginal Australia uh, and Torres Strait Islander Australia, a future that you know, is, 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 is healthy, that um, enables us to carry our culture into that future, into that mainstream you know, as it rolls along. And I think that's some of the challenges for us. And I think. Um, Aboriginal trained, Torres Strait Islander trained teacher education specialists have a role in thinking through that. Because in, um, that's probably my final point on this, the, the really thinking about how do we bring knowledge transmission across generations for Aboriginal communities is absolutely vital to our future. You know, the, there are very few things that actually force government to have a conversation with us and two things that force them to have a conversation with us are the Aboriginal Heritage Acts, federal and state-based, and uh, the Native Title Act. They are two pieces of legislation that require conversations to occur. And if we don't know our story, our song, our history, our country, and we can't talk to that, that is we can't actually speak to our cultural heritage, um, then we actually don't have a place in the conversation any longer. So knowledge transmission becomes absolutely critical. Um, and, and what I see, and the danger is that if all our kids are in, um, st in the state system, whether they're you know, state education systems or private systems, and we're not actively doing something at the community level for knowledge transmission across generations, we've got a huge problem into the future. And so that, when you, when you mix, put that into the mix and you think about where our people work, what they go into and how they work, which systems they work in, um, I think you know, that, that's a big challenge for us. The 
Bachelor of Education here at Flinders University and the inclusion of uh, Indigenous topics um, within that degree program, which brings with it um, you know, perspectives on education from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander position. Um, one of the, I think one of, the, one of the things that we did here in the early period of Yungarendi was to make the argument that the staff in here wanted to be involved in teaching. Yeah, um, most of us, as I said earlier, were, were trained um, teachers. That was the strength of the, the centre at that time. Um, and, uh, and so we approached the School of Education and said, we want to we teach. And we want to teach into your school um, because that's where most of us have our expertise and we want to run topics in it. Um, so we negotiated that and, and it happened. Um, and it began as a, an elective topic in its first year and from after that first year it became a, a core compulsory topic within the teacher education program. And I think it's been fundamental, um, fundamental to shaping you know, what is now a generation of um, teacher education students. It's only the one topic um, you know, across their four year degree, so it's, it's a relatively short time. But I think the, the, the kind of quality of that topic has been such that um, I still have you know, people that I worked with you know, in, the, in the tutorial group making contact you know, 15 years after we first were delivering this topic, um, making contacts, telling us where they are now, what they're doing, wh whether they're still in teaching or out of it. If they are in teaching, what they're, what they're doing inside it. Um, some of them have moved through to very influential positions within the sector, you know, as, as senior management inside schools and, and uh, going into things like um, uh, the SACE board and other places. So that topic's been really influential in that way. And it's been based largely on um, a model of teaching that does some history, because we find that most of the student body who are non-Aboriginal um, don't have a good grasp of history, which is an indictment on our education system. Um, that we, so we have to do this, we have to lay a foundation for that in order to be able to have a conversation about what does it mean to teach Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. It uh, uses race theory, you know, so where does the idea of race come from? Why are we trained to think of people in racial categories? How has racism um, affected the, uh, the the schooling of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, Indigenous children across the world? What anti-racism strategies out there? Um, what might be useful in talking about anti-racism? Uh, and uh, and this is where I think the real value comes in. Often, in that topic, the first four <coughs> excuse me, um, the first four weeks in that topic are often a, a challenge to people's um, own histories, their own sensibilities, you know, what they know and, uh, and that disrupts them, it unsettles them in, in, in ways that, and, and often the response to that is a bit of pushback, you know, they don't like what we've got to say, we're too political, too radical, too Indigenous focused in an Indigenous topic, you know, that kind of pushback. And it's only after, again, the relationship building and, and when you start to connect that history with what it means to be an effective educator, what it means to operate in schools, um, that they can't um, now because of various things that the federal government does, they can't avoid Aboriginal education in wherever they, their workforce they might end up in. Um, it's actually become very, very useful to, to having them think about um, what role they have to play. <coughs> and I argue, and I've, I say it directly to the students in fact, is that for me this is not about A plus B plus C equals D and that's what you do. Um, there is no formula to working in Aboriginal education. There are, there is, it's about process, and you really need to think about what the process is. And so we talk about the process. Um, and it's not about me uh, or any, anyone else actually uh, you know, opening up your head and pouring information into it and closing it up and saying, there, now you know. Um, so it's not, as Paolo Ferreri would call, the banking system of you know, knowledge where you just you know, make deposits and then people have knowledge. You know. It's actually, um, from my perspective, a process issue, but it's also a heart issue um, because I actually challenge them to, to lead with their heart, to make a commitment to uh, Indigenous um, children, to make a commitment to thinking about Aboriginal education every time 
they determine that they're going to teach something in the classroom setting. So whatever you're doing, ask yourself the question, is there an Indigenous, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective on what I'm about to teach? So if I'm teaching about water, you know, what, how might we teach about water from an Aboriginal perspective? If I'm teaching some lesson in geography or some English lesson where we're looking at a, at a particular issue or set of texts, what might you do and what can you bring into the classroom? So I try to actually get to their hearts, get them to make the commitment. The, the rest of it, you know, the, the, the knowledge, what they learn, you know, that's constantly evolving. You know, they, they will continue to learn more. They will continue to grow beyond their years here um, if they make the commitment. If they don't make the commitment, they'll stay where they were. So uh, that, that's, uh, that's kind of what I emphasise continually, you know, that they have to make a commitment and they have a responsibility to. You know, so that's, you know, so when I talk about perspectives, you know, I'm not sort of so interested in, you know, this and that and that and that, you know. Broadly outline it, talk about you know, history, talk about the importance of land and water and country to Aboriginal people, talk about relationships to family, relationships to the, to the Ngarchis, to the animals and the birds and those sorts of things. Um, you know, I, I can talk about all those things, but in the end, you know, unless they've made the commitment to learn and commitment to ongoing kind of learning, then, then we don't get very far. So that's, that's where I challenge them, at that level. My, my current role at the university is, is kind of multi-dimensioned. Multi um, I have the formal title of Dean Indigenous Strategy and Engagement. I also have a role in Yungarendi First Nations Centre as the research coordinator. And uh, those two overlap. Um, in, in various ways, mostly in relation to thinking about strategic engagement with Aboriginal communities. That's really what my, my, my research agenda has been about. Um, I work closely with the Ngunnawal community, I'm a member of it. Uh, I chair the Ngunnawal Enterprises Proprietary Limited, which is the economic development arm of the community organisation. Uh, I'm a member of the Ngunnawal Regional Authority, our governance structures, research policy and planning unit. So that kind of work. And it's mostly been in, in um, thinking about how do we address the issue of building core capacity in an Aboriginal community and uh, why do we want to build core capacity? Um, it's really be able to, be, to move towards a, a better future, a healthier future, um, better well-being for our community. Um, and uh, you know, we kind of work on the, the philosophy of Ngarandari Rui Rua. Um, Rui being land, uh, Rua being body and spirit. And uh, so land, body and spirit is a kind of Ngarandari way of thinking about things, you know, guides us. So we're constantly asking questions as to what do we do and what's the impact on land, body, spirit. And so whatever the projects might be, we, that's our reference point. So what I do in the Dean's role is use that same thing. Um, I think about what are the kind of valuable things that we can be doing at the university level, which is a very privileged environment, um, to think about the kinds of issues, um, challenges that we have inside the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community in a broad sense. Um, most of my examples emerge out of the Ngunnawal experience um, and uh, that's largely been about um, trying to create the environment um, such that the Ngunnawal community can have far more <coughs> say, uh, more power, um, except, as we've argued for, more responsibility for the management of our futures, be they around land, water, education, knowledge transmission, cultural heritage, whatever that, those things might be. And uh, as I said, the university has a lot of smart people in it, has a lot of resources, has a, and I think is a key player. Uh, in terms of thinking about Indigenous community development, um, guided by what Indigenous communities want, which has got to be the overriding kind of factor to that. It's not a matter of staff in these institutions going in and saying, I know what's best for you. Um, that doesn't work. Um, and in fact, most of the time they don't know what's best and they get it wrong. It's about a recognition of the skill sets that they have and the way that those skill sets actually become valuable and useful 
to the Aboriginal community to address the issues that the Aboriginal community wants to deal with. And so, you know, one of the things that we say um, there to government, for example, is that if you want somebody to come out and talk to us about the management of a wetland area, um, don't employ somebody within your department or one of your departments to come out and talk to us and gather minus for information and then go back and deliver a report of some kind. <coughs> Under an agreement with the Ngunnawal Regional Authority, provide the funds to the regional authority, build our core capacity, and we'll deliver on the sorts of things that you're looking for, but we own them and we control that process. So that kind of thing uh, in terms of uh, the Dean's role in, in bringing together an Aboriginal community, government, a university, and thinking about how we work together in, for the betterment uh, and in the interests of an Aboriginal community is kind of what I see being very, very useful. Of course, um, as, as the Dean, I have to think about issues like teaching and research and Aboriginal employment in the university and all the other sorts of things that, that come with it, um, a lot of it which is driven out of you know, the, the people and the staff, um, the wonderful group of people that we have in you know, Um but also thinking about those that are in other parts of the university, you know, the, the post centre, um, in the Northern Territory and so on. So trying to, to, to kind of harness that in a way that's, that's more effective and, and useful. Um, for Aboriginal communities is kind of the challenge. And it's not easy to do um, across, the, <laughs> across the size of communities that we're dealing with, the range of interests, uh, the kind of priorities that people put, what the interests of the universities are. And, and so it's actually, um, you know, in that sense I've become more of a conduit. You know, you can't do it all yourself. As I'm starting to discover, um, you know, um, I just don't have the time uh, or energy to be able to do the lot, but facilitate, connect, you know, um, get, get people talking with each other, you know, reposition things, reprioritise things, get Indigenous you know, matters on the agenda in a higher order than sometimes they've been in the past. So, so that's what I see the role of the Dean as being and doing. Um, it connects with the kind of research program that I've got going um, with a bunch of other people. And that's probably the other thing, you know, individuals don't do this stuff. Individuals can't do this stuff. It's actually about collectives. It's how do we create conditions where people work collectively around common interests and in doing so work you know, respectfully and, and all those sorts of things that come with that. But you know, um, thinking about collectives becomes really important. In, in relation to the issue of sort of knowledge transmission across generation, um, cultural knowledge um, and what some have described as kind of secret sacred knowledge, I think there is a, there is a challenge for people going into the profession, you know, to be uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander teacher trained, um, teacher educated people. And that is, you know, we have to constantly make choices about what we bring in to the classrooms that we work in. Um, and some of the things that uh, we, we might want to bring in or um, would have value in, in, in the work that we do, we actually can't. We, we can't bring it in because, uh, you know, one of, the, one, of the, one of the challenges that the Ngarrindri community faced over the High Marsh Island Bridge um, exercise, you know, the, the, the whole issue there about Ngunnawal women, f you know, um, who asserting knowledge around a site, another smaller group of Ngunnawal women saying they didn't know those stories, therefore, you know, the kind of political fallout of that, the, the Royal Commission and so on, was, was just that, the very issue about how much can you share and, and where do you share it, um, you know, and, and thinking about how your database that's the wrong term, but database knowledge in such a way that it, it has value but you don't give it all up and it's not all meant to be given up anyway. Um, and think, and they, they become really, really important issues. You know, I mean, earlier today I, I taught a group of students um, and they, were, they did a, um, a case study of the Ngalindri people and in it the teaching resources that the education department had developed. Um, you know, a, a book called Ngunnawal People in the Environment, which is a you know teaching resource, and it has dreaming stories. Um, it has exercises and activities that they can do as teacher education students. All of those sorts of things. Now, um, and we would and we would encourage that. Aboriginal people who have gone before have encouraged that, but only to a particular level. You know, um, if we were to teach about, they were teaching of, of Condoli, the whale today. 
um, and Connolly, you know, as a, as a dreaming, um, crosses over Ngarrindjali country and goes into Gauna country and, and moves into other places. Great lesson there that dreaming stories aren't just situated within one community, they actually cross country and that various community groups have parts to that story and, and they tell certain parts and people within the community have parts to that story and that knowledge um, that they share but they don't have it all necessarily in their part. And I think those sorts of challenges are, are very real challenges for Aboriginal t um, teachers who are in a, you know, an insider position in terms of community and knowledge in one sense, although they, depending on what the knowledge is and what the story is, they, they might not be, you know, like they could be a male Aboriginal teacher trained person um, who can't go out and speak about the issues at Kumarang, um, at High Marsh, because that's, that's women's business. You know, it's important for me to know that that site's important for women, and I can know that in a broad sense, but I don't need to have depth of that, you know, nor do I want it. You know, so that's their responsibility to care for country. So how we, how we think about um, country native title, the knowledges that we have, cultural knowledges, um, so that we don't, um, we don't kind of do damage and harm to the knowledge systems that operate within our community, yet at the same time plan for a future where those knowledges need to go into the future. I think that, for me, that's the greatest challenge that we have. I mean, you know, that's me as a teacher educator. That is the greatest challenge. Uh, and, uh, you know, I tend to want to go, I want to know it all. <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to know as much as I possibly can. And, uh, and I know that's probably not possible on one level, but I fear. I have a great fear for what that means for the future, you know. So you know, I'm, I'm not so much thinking about gender knowledge there. You know, I think there are, if there's women's knowledge that women in the, my community um, need to share across generation, then the, I think the women should get together and do that. And we should find ways to support them to do that so that they can take that responsibility and carry that as they should. And it's equally for the men. So I'm probably thinking more about um, within, say, the, the male, the cornies of the Ngunnawal community, um, what are we doing to ensure that our knowledge of country and story and song, dance and, uh, is being generated so that our kids can know it, you know? And you know, I, I'm married to a non-Aboriginal woman. Um, she can't teach my children about Ngunnawal cultural knowledge to the levels that um, other women from my community, my aunties and my dad's side, could teach for you. Know? So, so I think that's our greatest challenge. And um, one of the ways that um, we as the Ngunnawal community have managed that in dealing with things like um, the kind of agreements that we have with government over how to manage country and care for lands and waters and revegetate you know, land and water post um, drought here in South Australia is we've developed a cultural knowledge clause um, where Ngunnawal people get to determine what is cultural knowledge and whether that will be used um, in any um, management plan, any textbook that's produced, any anything that becomes an, you know, a part of the archive. So that what we're saying is in effect we want to be able to determine what goes into the archive as our engagements happen outside our community but that still leaves unanswered the question about what do we do inside our own archive, inside the community. And I think, um, I've said it a couple of times now, that is our biggest challenge. Because they won't talk to us in the end. You know, if you give up your cultural knowledge, so you, if you give it away to government, or you don't do it yourself, you map yourself out of existence. That's what we do. We map ourselves out of existence. So if the government has a map of who we are, what we know, and, and, and all the things that connect to there, they don't need us anymore. They've got the map. They can do what they want, you know, they know what we know, they've, they've, they've collected it. Um, so, you know, holding back from them is important, I think, you know, part of our strategy. Um, but it also, you know, holding back from them um, is, 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 is something that's cultural, it's not just a, you know, a, a political strategy, it's actually something deeper than that. So, um, so that, that becomes the, you know, if you're connected to this project, strongly encouraging more Aboriginal people to take up teaching as a profession, I think they have to think deeply about those sorts of issues, you know, because it's not just a matter of going, oh, I know stuff and I'm going to tell the world about it. You know, it's actually a bit more than that. You know, it's, it's about how do you work in the community, cultural context. So, you know, I, I worry. <laughs> I worry about that side of it because I don't think uh, Aboriginal Australia, um, certainly, well, I shouldn't speak for Aboriginal Australia, I don't think 
the Ngunnawadi people um, have thought about this enough. You know, some of us are, some of us are putting it on the table, um, but it's really difficult to work your way through. You know, and when people are dealing with worrying about you know, where the next meal comes from, you know, or, um, some of the issue that you know family members um, got themselves into trouble, or you know somebody's not very well and they're in hospital, you know those sorts of daily things that happen in people's lives actually kind of consume it. So finding their space to be able to create you know a, an opportunity to have this kind of conversation and sort it out. And I think you know I I think uh, government has a role to play in this. Not not for them to. Um, to tell us how to do it, but to resource the doing of it. You know, um, I think they have a huge responsibility. And I know the Ngunnawadi, from one point, we got um, some money to run some culture camps, and uh, we had six of them. And they were one of some of the best experiences I've ever had, you know, bringing community together, having the resources to hire some buses, get on the buses, have elders take us through country, talk to us about, you know, this place and that place and this is what happened here and, and tell funny stories about, you know, auntie so-and-so who did this and, you know, uncle so-and-so who did that. You know, I think um, those sorts of things are really important, you know, to have meals and together where we find a place on country and we can have a cook-up and a yarn and, you know, that, those sorts of experiences are, are hugely important um, and, and we don't get to do them enough. And that's why I ask the question about, you know, where do our teachers end up? I'm, I'm, I'm more concerned that they actually end up with communities, working with communities, uh, and doing things that are useful and valuable. And for some time now, have argued um, that the university community, its academics, need to take up the responsibility of teaching uh, non-Aboriginal Australia about Aboriginal Australia. Um, I think you know that's their responsibility. And while, whilst we want to have a role to play in that. Um, and we, we need to, to kind of shape that because we don't want it to kind of be a, a bad story or a story that kind of doesn't represent the way Aboriginal communities are talking about the issues that they face. Um, I just don't think we've got enough of us to take up that job. And, and I think our communities are crying out for us. So when we go to the question of what might the universities do, I think the universities have got to find ways to be able to support Aboriginal academics and those within our Aboriginal centres to actually work with communities around the issues that they have to face. And if that means that um, you have to rethink um, your kind of um, the academic profiles that we work to, the kind of expectations of us for teaching, um, the kind of uh, what, what, we, what, what might we do in terms of community engagement and research that's actually of use and value of writing, of advocating, of lobbying for, I think that's all the kinds of things that our centres can't be doing, and that, and the and the university takes value from that. You know, if you're <coughs> winning projects, if you're publishing, you're doing those things. That's all stuff that the university can count. That's all really, really important things. That's what an academic does. Um, but at the moment, the way the system operates is that um, it's largely seen to be that the Aboriginal academics work for the university, teaching the university population about Aboriginal Australia, and I think that flip in the relationship. Um, and and that university actively supporting that is where we need to head. And I have to be, be kind of um, give this university some credit for that. I'm not just saying because I'm an employee of Flinders, but I think Flinders has actually um, has, has kind of taken on that challenge. It's thought about them. It's um, through, for example, the um, the academic profiles for Yungarendi, and we got to write write our profile. We got to privilege the things that we do. We got to privilege the things that we saw as important for doing. Uh, and so, you know, they exist. We, so our promotions um, and, and our movement through the system into sort of more senior positions is kind of predicated on something that we developed. So that, you know, that's, that, and the university accepted that, you know, it, it adopted that. So that's, you know, a huge plus. It's really trying to think about community engagement. We still got to, you know, um, sort of fulfil the kind of functions of an academic in its broadest sense, but I still think there's some room for negotiation about what that looks like. Um, at the same time, though, and this is the challenge inside of Yungarendi, is that not everybody wants to work in that way. There are some people who, who want to work in a different way, Aboriginal people, um, who um, see the kind of work that they're doing operating within 
rather than, say, a specific Indigenous community context within a kind of community of practice. So they might want to work with in, in teacher education with all those things uh, who are involved in it, or they might want to work, you know, in, in a, with you know, um, in, a, in screen, for example, with you know. Um, SA Film or Arts SA or you know Country Arts SA or whoever. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean working in a specific Indigenous community context, but working in ways that actually benefit uh, and provide benefit and value to the Aboriginal community in its broader sense. So, and I'm comfortable with that. I, I really am. I, I I think what we have to be able to do is create the kind of environments where people want to be active, want to learn and see value in what they do, and that actually end up having some value for the Aboriginal community. Um, and I think the university. Um, can be um, challenged to think about that even more than they have at the moment. And uh, that's what I hope to be able to do of, in that Dean's role, some of that work. Yeah.